On the southwestern edge of the inhospitable, boulder-strewn landscape of the Scottish Cairngorm Plateau stands Ben McDewey, the second highest peak in all the British Isles. Mist-laden, desolate, sometimes agreeable but at other times heavy with thick snow patches that persist for much of the year, the mountain has attracted outdoorsmen for centuries. In the midst of the Second World War, in October 1943, a captain and mountaineer of considerable experience by the name of Alexander Twenyon was one such adventurer. Having dedicated ten days' leave to hiking throughout the Cairngorms, Twenyon had his sights set on Ben McDewey's lonely summit. Climbing alone, his rations were in short supply, and so he took to keeping his revolver loaded and close at hand, lest a rabbit or other small game be so unfortunate enough as to cross his path. One afternoon, just as he had reached the summit cairn of the Ben, the weather is said to have suddenly changed. Mist swirled across the Larry Grew Pass and enveloped the mountain, as a fierce, bitter wind whisked among the boulders. Such forced the soldier to initiate a retreat. It was then, so goes his testimony, as published in an issue of the Scots magazine some fifteen years later, that Twenyon heard an odd sound echoing through the mist. It was, so it seemed, a loud footstep. Not merely that, it was followed by a second and then a third sounds that, given the isolation of the mountain, so startled the soldier that he reached for the revolver in his pocket. Grasping the butt, he peered about in the mist, only for a strange shape to loom up, recede, and come charging at him. His weapon was pulled out and shot three times at the ghostly figure. Still, it came towards him. At that point, Twenyon supposedly turned and rushed down the path, reaching, so he wrote in 1958, the ancient Pinewood Valley of Glenderry in a time I have never bettered. No one followed him, and yet he had, as far as he was concerned, been pursued for some of the way, the strange shape he had encountered being something otherworldly. Specifically, it had been the Big Grey Man, the unknown and ominous entity rumoured to haunt the vast summit plateau and freezing mountain passes of Ben McDewey. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. If you will allow a quick and shameless bit of self-promotion before we explore the subject matter. If you are new here, hello and welcome. My name is Laura and I post video essay documentaries on all things strange and spooky. I also share some of my more personal explorations and investigations over on my second channel, Laura Ralton, linked in the description and on screen now. I recently published an hour-long episode there, an in-depth investigation of the infamously haunted Skirid Mountain Inn. Prior to that, I released somewhat of a sequel to my 2019 documentary film In Search of the Dead, which I am extremely proud of. And so, if you do enjoy this video, I would very much appreciate a subscription from you, both here and on my second channel. And for those of you wanting to show even more support, I have a membership platform on Patreon and here on YouTube, again links in the description, via which I recently shared this member exclusive video, in which I discuss my future plans for the Paranormal Scholar. Thank you so much for all of the support you show my work, most especially those of you who are members. Truly, you are the beating heart of the work that I do here. Now, with that said, let's dive deep or rather, climb high into this video. In Alexander Twenyon's 1958 account, he was clear to state that he had traversed McDewey in mist and camped near its summit for days on end on different occasions, often alone and always with an easy mind. He was by no means an inexperienced outdoorsman and didn't consider himself to be unduly imaginative, and yet, in regards to that October day, he had no explanation for what he encountered, other than to conclude that it was the legendary Grey Man presence said to lurk amongst the crags and corries of the mountain. For indeed, this was not the first time a mountaineer had alleged a strange experience on Scotland's famous peak. The quintessential case associated with the Grey Man of Ben McDewey legend can be said to be that of Professor John Norman Colley, a professional scientist and fellow of the Royal Society who is arguably best remembered for his deep affection for mountaineering. 
It was in 1925 that he shared his story of an encounter with something strange on the Ben McDewey summit. The year was 1891, and similar to Twenyon some half a century later, Professor Colley had not long left the summit can when he heard something else than merely the noise of his own footsteps. For every few steps he took, he claimed he heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after him, but taking steps three or four times the length of his own. Again like Twenyon, he was alone and in the mist. Initially brushing off the sounds as nonsense, the professor at the 27th Annual General Meeting of the Cairngorm Club in December 1925 spoke of how he listened and heard the unexpected sound again, the eerie crunch crunch that seemed to suggest someone was following him. It was at that point the austere professor stated that he was seized with terror and took to his heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles until he reached a forested area. Whatever you make of it, Professor Colley is reported as having said, I do not know, but there is something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey, and I will not go back there again by myself. Serious words for a man who was not merely a noted mountaineer, claiming significant ascents of peaks across Scotland and the Alps, but also a professor of organic chemistry, esteemed for his remarkable personality and sharp mind. Not one to suffer fools gladly, a figure so calm and analytical that it has been claimed that he served as an inspiration for the legendary character of Sherlock Holmes, it is incomprehensible that Professor Colley would have invented such a sensational story. Equally, it can be said to be improbable that he would have overreacted and simply scared himself into, in his own words, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles. Mountains, let alone those in misty conditions, are wildly dangerous places, something of which the professor would have been well aware. And so, why did he run? What on earth could have scared him so badly that he risked a broken limb or worse in order to get away from it? Such is a question that preoccupied the mind of fellow mountaineer and author Affleck Gray for the majority of his life. A proud Scotsman, said to have known every peak and corrie, glen and strath of the Cairngorm Mountains, he, in 1970, published a comprehensive book sharing his research on the Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey. Reading it, one very quickly comes to realise that, not only is this legend old, quite possibly as old as the mountains themselves, but also sees certain unsettling characteristics repeated from one story to the next. The most obvious, as showcased in both Twenyon's and Professor Colley's testimonies, is the sound of loud footsteps being heard on the otherwise desolate mountain. Second is the sensation of utter dread and desperation. For certainly, it is no small thing to read testimonies from soldiers and experienced mountaineers alleging such a high degree of fear that they felt it necessary to break into a run so as to flee from the summit of a mountain with experiences ranging from a crinkly feeling on the back of a neck to an eerie sensation of apprehension, even those who previously knew nothing of the Grey Man legend have reported encountering a heavy atmosphere and feeling of real dread whilst exploring the Ben. One example, dating to the year 2000, describes how a hiker thought we were the only ones to have had such an encounter, after they were forced to hurry for home upon hearing two distinct footsteps directly behind them. Gripped by the uncanny feeling that something was following him and his friend, the Scottish hikers said they ultimately ran, despite the danger posed to them by loose shale underfoot. We didn't care, the experience was shared via an online testimony. I was physically shaking, and had no wish to ever return to that mountain. Peculiarly, they concluded by stating that whatever was causing this feeling was huge. I cannot explain why, but I had the mental impression that this entity was a giant. And so, the big grey man of Ben McDewey. It is an odd thing that, despite this so-called presence's physically descriptive appellation, visual descriptions are rarely ever given. Certainly, Alexander Twenyon reported seeing a strange shape come from the mist towards him, but no specific details were provided. 
In the case of Professor Colley, the year 2000 experiencer, and many others who have shared their own encounters from the Ben, it is often the case that no physical entity, creature or person is seen. Instead, time and time again, we encounter reports that speak in terms of feelings and mental impressions. Instinctive knowing that what is being encountered on Scotland's second highest peak is a being of huge and terrifying proportions. Even when one looks at Scottish poetry, one finds mention of the giant spirit of the storm aloft on Grey Cairn Gorm, a form said to have chilled blood in the 18th century poet James Hogg's Glen Avon. It has been proposed that Hogg, a self-educated shepherd and farmhand, almost certainly spent the night amongst the rocky wilderness that is Ben McDewey. But what he may or may not have seen when he did is up for debate. For all of this, there have, over the centuries, been a handful of precise descriptions given by individuals who claim to have seen the Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey. One, remarkable and horrifyingly sensational, belongs to a hiker who set himself the challenge of spending a cold January night alone camped beside the Ben McDewey Summit Cairn. Described in Affleck Gray's book, we are told how he, huddled against the cold in his tent, was suddenly overcome by a strange sense of the non-real, a feeling which ultimately heightened to the point that the hiker felt as though they were no longer a man, but rather a hunted animal, forcing his body down into the earth. In short, there was something outside of his tent. Overcome by what is described as an age-old instinct to conceal himself in the presence of extreme danger, the hiker waited for the feeling of horror to diminish. Once it did, he is said to have opened the flysheet of his tent and, against the black of the night, observed a great brown creature swaggering down the hill. It looked to have been powerful, covered in shortish brown hair, with a head that was disproportionately large. Above all, however, the hiker reported it to have been at least 20 feet in height. The testimony then continues to explain how, the next morning, the hiker spent a considerable amount of time checking and double-checking the measurement of the creature he had encountered against the horizon and other natural markers. There was, in his mind at least, no disputing it. He had seen a giant. Considered in this way, the loud and long-strided footsteps frequently reported on the mountain make a little more sense. As does, one may argue, the feeling of mortal danger. After all, if a being of such colossal and swaggering proportions does exist on Ben McDewey, then any, soldiers and hillmen included, have a good reason to be fearful. Of course, assertions of giants are not easy to accept, especially when, for the scientifically minded, a natural phenomenon exists which may help to explain such sightings. Known as a Brocken Spectre, this rare but not impossible optical illusion appears when the sun shines low in the sky behind an observer, causing the individual's shadow to be greatly magnified and cast upon a cloud or mist. This spectral shadow image can appear to move, not merely because of the movement of the observer, but also because of the movement of the cloud or mist itself, and any variations in density therein. For those skeptical of the Grey Man legend, a misidentification of a Brocken Spectre serves as a valid explanation. And yet, while such might be the case in many alleged sightings, it is difficult to reconcile this explanation with those including the one just described, given that it occurred at night. Of course, it can be said that the entire testimony is bogus, we do not, after all, have the name of the hiker. And yet, they are far from the only person to have reported sightings of something strange and large on Ben McDewey. Indeed, a recent account speaks of a creepy grey silhouette in the fog being sighted on the peak of Ben McDewey on the night of the 27th of September 2022. The report came via the nearby Mar Lodge estate and a ranger who shared an image of the whiteboard they keep for visitors to share wildlife that they've seen. The grey silhouette was, without a doubt, very different from the usual mix of squirrels, adders and eagles. Occurring in the evening, it is thus unlikely to have been sunlight which caused the appearance of the creepy grey shadow. 
Not merely this, it is arguably offensive to assert that experienced mountaineers would so easily confuse ordinary phenomenon with a mythical being, and even then, most grey man reports are of a multi-sensory nature, for example, auditory footsteps and feelings of dread. The visual phenomenon of a Brocken spectre does not account for this, with it therefore being easy to see how this fails to be a satisfactory explanation for the grey man. And so, what are people encountering on Ben McDewey? Yet another intriguing testimony can be said to be that of Joan Grant, the so-called English reincarnationist who wrote several historical novels said to have been informed by past lives Grant recalled while in a hypnotic or trance-like state. Someone thus claimed to have innate psychic awareness, she, along with her first husband Leslie Grant, visited the Cairn Gorms in the summer of 1928. After picnicking and sunbathing together, they intended to walk for another mile or so before returning home for dinner. Their planned idyllic end to the day, however, would not happen. Instead, suddenly, and for no apparent reason, Joan is said to have been seized with such terror that she turned and, in a panic, fled back along the path. Her husband followed in quick pursuit, worried as to what had so startled his wife. Joan, however, described being so terrified that she could only spare breath enough to tell him to run faster, faster. Something, so she wrote, utterly malign, four-legged and yet obscenely human, invisible and yet solid enough for me to hear the pounding of its hooves was trying to reach me. If it did, I should die, for I was far too frightened to know how to defend myself. And so, she continued to run, not stopping until she, about half a mile later, burst through what she described as an invisible barrier behind which she was safe. A year later, so she claimed, one of her father's professors described an almost exactly similar experience he had when bug hunting in the Cairngorms. When asked to provide an explanation as to what she thought may have been the cause of her panic, she simply stated, I wish I could give you an explanation, but I can only presume that I inadvertently tuned into an acute terror of someone who had a great deal of energy still locked up in that particular place. In this way, might it then be appropriate to think of the grey man as some sort of spirit of the dead that has the ability on occasion to reveal itself in physical form? Such, after all, is not an uncommon concept when one considers the multitudes of white lady and dark spectre haunted pubs, prisons and castles which litter the remainder of the British Isles. A haunted mountain is certainly unusual, but not inherently impossible. That there is a psychic element to the grey man phenomena would certainly help to explain why, for all of the footsteps said to have been heard on and about the peak, footprints are rarely, if ever, reported. For example, in the case of experienced climber Tony Ma, who visited Ben McDewey along with two friends in August 1977, a night at the Ben's famous Shelterstone Refuge ended in confusion and terror when Ma was woken by the sound of granite boulders knocking together as someone was picking their way through the boulder field towards us. Feeling frightened and threatened, the hiker reported rolling over in his sleeping bag, trying to see a glimpse of torchlight through gaps in the shelter's dry stone walls. There was no one and nothing there. Time passed, and the footsteps are said to have begun to approach the rear of the shelter stone, with a slow, regular, and heavy thrump, thrump, thrump. At a distance of no more than ten feet from where Ma lay, they stopped. In the morning, no amount of searching by him or his companions could reveal footprints or any other sign of material disturbance about their camp, even though snow had fallen in the night. Continuing in this way, over the years there have been suggestions that, far from being an ordinary mountain, Ben McDewey has special supernatural significance, making it particularly suited to those with clairvoyant vision. This, conceivably, could make one more likely to gain an awareness of lingering souls of the dead stuck atop the bairn, or even increase the likelihood of coming into contact with some other manner of paranormal entity, such as an elemental grey giant. 
Indeed, in his book on the subject, Affleck Gray notes that, as far as he knows, with the exception of one, not a single other experience of a psychic or supernatural nature has ever been recorded on any other mountain of the Cairngorm group but Ben McDewey. Elaborating on this peculiarity, a booklet published in 1949 by the Edinburgh Psychic College reportedly proposed the theory that the physical attributes of Ben McDewey, the very rocks themselves, might create conditions favourable to psychic sensitivity. And far from being pseudo-scientific bunk, this notion does find backing in the research of scientists including Dr. David Luke, an associate professor of psychology at the University of Greenwich who, in 2014, co-wrote an article published in the Journal of Parapsychology which concluded that, whilst tentative, the findings of a four-year study into the relationship between local geomagnetic activity and psychic awareness warranted further research. In short, there is evidence that psychic experiences are related to geomagnetic activity, with it long being noted by folklorists that certain parts of the world seem to have a higher than average percentage of psychically aware individuals. In regards to the British Isles, Marie Trevelyan, for example, notes in her 1909 Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales that particularly in South Wales, people are endowed with second sight. Might this have something to do with the region's famous coal and iron rich valleys? Such a line of thinking is intriguing. Relating this to Scotland's Ben McDewey, it is possible to find reports of magnetic anomalies on the peak, for example by the Cairngorm Club when some of its members were caught in a heavy snowstorm on the summit. Unable to see, they attempted to rely on their compass, only for its needle to move peculiarly, jerking about violently from side to side. Might the geological composition of the mountain therefore have something to do with the happenings which are reported there? Such is, of course, all speculation, but given the uncharted territory in which the paranormal stands, is worth discussing nonetheless. For certainly the concept of inexplicable mountain panic, whilst not necessarily connected to any of the other peaks in the Cairngorms, has been reported elsewhere. In a Ghost Club newsletter written by the Society for Psychical Research's Alan Murdy, this concept is tentatively explored, with the work of Fortean researcher and author Andy Roberts being referenced. There are said to be other sites in the UK where so-called mountain panic occurs, including Bleaklow Hill in Derbyshire. Here, so Roberts reveals, one witness even reported, in a manner very similar to Ben McDewey's Grey Man, encountering a huge shadow-like figure as high as a house. The witness is said to have been hit by such terror that it felt as though they had been struck a physical blow. Roberts suggests that it may be some attribute of the physical environment which caused this, once again tying back to the concept of geomagnetic influence. At this point, it is also worth stressing the seemingly innate link between mountains and giant folklore. In addition to Ben McDewey's Grey Man being frequently regarded as a giant, other mountains and hills across the British Isles are likewise said to have their own monstrous mythical connections, two brief examples being Cada Idris in Wales and the Rekin in England. Similarly, although not quite the same, mountains and other high places are often also linked to extraterrestrials. And certainly, in the case of Ben McDewey, some have suggested this as an explanation for the strangeness reported on the summit. Indeed, some even claim the interior of the mountain to be hollow, containing an alien base. If one is so minded, it is worth asking why such stories and connections exist. Truly, there is much that can be explored in this regard, research and speculation that would take us well beyond the confines of the colossal that is Ben McDewey. Suffice to say, there is something worthy of study on the Scottish Peak's bleak, rocky summit. Even when one respectfully considers the statements made by mountaineers intimately familiar with the Ben, asserting how they have never experienced anything at all odd on the mountain, it would be unjust to chalk up the rest to undue superstition, silliness and broken spectres. There are simply too many that are too similar. 
Undoubtedly, the wild and open remoteness of the mountain may do something to the human psyche, but why that something is always a very specific, heavy-footed, fear-inducing big grey man is inexplicable. Even more inexplicable is how this legend is embedded into Highland culture. As Affleck Gray points out that the mythical figure has a Scots Gaelic name, Fier Liath Moore, says much about its historical legacy. Not only that, at the time of writing his book, first published in 1970, he was able to speak with octogenarians who recalled being threatened as children with a visit from the big grey man should they misbehave. He has always been there, and considering testimonies as recent as 2022, seems as though he may continue to be there yet. Thank you so much for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget I have more content for you to enjoy over on my second channel, Laura Roughton. You can find links both in the description and on screen now. Thank you again. Until next time, 